I believe Oscar Wilde said it best. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. And in Hotline Miami 2, there's a group of veterans that are trying to recreate the events of the first game. They took inspiration from Jacket's slaughter of the Russian Mafia, and after the fame and renown he's gained, they decide they're going to try the same thing in an effort to get their own 15 minutes of fame. In this video, we'll look to see why the fans idolized Jacket, their efforts to recreate the events of Hotline Miami, and their ultimate fate. Now the fans' fascination with Jacket actually begins way back in 1985. Like Jacket, the fans were enlisted in the military and fought in Hawaii during the Soviet-American War. However, unlike Jacket, they weren't a part of a special forces unit, but instead part of D Company. D Company was much more standard in their operations and were not as well trained as the Ghost Wolf Special Forces Unit. Now in October of 1985, D Company was tasked with capturing a Soviet stronghold, and due to inferior training, they failed in their assault, and the unit suffered heavy casualties. In order to capture the stronghold, Command sent in the elite Ghost Wolves unit to capture the base, which they did successfully. Amazed that the unit captured the base, the fans regarded the Ghost Wolves with high esteem and began to idolize the soldiers in the unit, which included Beard and also Jacket. However, a few months after that, in April of 1986, is the bombing of San Francisco and America's implied defeat in the Soviet-American War. In the years that followed, the fans were discharged from the military and make their home in Miami, but they never forgot their experiences from the war and never forgot about the Ghost Wolves. Now, during the murders of the Russian Mafia by masked individuals in 1989, the fans weren't recruited for an unknown reason. Whether this is due to them not joining 50 Blessings or not being good enough for 50 Blessings isn't known, but they are forced to stand by as others are recruited to assist in the elimination of the Russian Mafia. The killings go on until the leader of the Russian Mafia is finally eliminated and his killer is arrested. As information comes out, the fans are surprised to learn that his killer was none other than one of the soldiers they idolized in Hawaii, Jacket. A media frenzy begins and Jacket is instantly rocketed to fame. Every news outlet in Miami is covering the story. Hollywood begins making a movie based on his actions and there's even rumors of a book being written about his experiences. Seeing someone they revere gain instant fame fills the fans with incredible envy, and wanting to be like their idol, they decide to mimic the events that made him famous. They start by ordering boxes of animal masks and choosing the ones that they like. Corey, who is quiet and cautious, chooses a zebra mask. Mark, who is the largest, picks a bear mask. Alex and Ash, a junkie and a techie respectively, choose matching swan masks. And Tony, who is only interested in the violence, gets his hands on a Tony mask that he says has been worn by Jacket himself. They then steal an old phone home van and convert one of their local hangouts into a base for themselves. In the base, they set up numerous phones in the hope that one of them will ring and give them a mission, just like what happened to Jacket. However, the fans don't realize that 50 blessings were the source of the calls, and they stopped leaving messages after Jacket killed the leader of the Russian Mafia. So, of course, weeks go by without any of the phones ringing. Finally, on Halloween in 1991, the fans take matters into their own hands and patrol the streets looking for a target. They find a gang hideout in an electronic shop and kill all of those inside. To celebrate their first killing, they go out and get pizza. Several weeks pass and the phones of the hideout still aren't ringing, so the fans are forced to take jobs from friends of theirs. On November 22nd, their friend Andy asks them to attack a bar that houses a Russian bodyguard and kill the hitman, which they do with ease. Then, on December 2nd, their friend Jack asks them to raid a place full of junkies and lowlifes to rescue his sister, who hasn't been home in weeks. The fans kill all the people inside and find Jack's sister hiding in a closet. They ask her to come with them, but she refuses and the fans leave without her. This creates an unintended consequence. Leaving Jack's sister alive creates a witness to their crimes. She goes to the police to report the massacre of her friends, and shortly afterwards, the media hears the story of new masked vigilantes. They run with the story, and the fans are featured on every news outlet in Miami, and even featured on the Channel 6 News on December 8th. The fans' plan to get famous like Jacket is finally coming to fruition, and they revel in their five minutes of fame. 
They desire to increase their renown further, and since the phones still aren't ringing, the fans again take matters into their own hands and clear out a drug den filled with gangsters found by Alex. They find that the gangsters have set up a base in the sewers below the building and go to clear that out as well. Here, they find that the gangsters have set up what seems to be a torture chamber and are dissolving corpses and acid, dumping the remains down the drain. The fans clear out the remaining gangsters and flee the sewers. The very next day, Alex hears a knock on her door. She asks who it is to hear it's the police, and they're asking for her to open the door. She says she needs to go get dressed, and while in her room, she sweeps her swan costume under the bed. She comes back to open the door to find the man at her door has already entered her house, and is seemingly investigating her kitchen. As Alex approaches, the man says he came in because the door wasn't locked and asks for Ash, her brother. Alex tells the detective that Ash doesn't live here anymore and asks him to leave. The detective complies and as he leaves, Alex is left wondering if the police are onto them. After all, the media have been making a bigger deal out of the new masked vigilantes. Due to the police and the grisly sewer scene, the fans lay low for a while. Then, on December 20th, Mark enters their hideout with new masks for them to try on. They're rooster masks, and when the fans try them on, they begin talking. But they don't. It's strange. To Mark, it's as if the mask itself was speaking. And all it's saying is something about a roof. A phone rings, and a flash of white reveals that Mark had been hallucinating. Alex rushes over to the phones to answer the call, but none of those phones are ringing. Ash reveals the cell phone he stole from the Russian bodyguard is ringing, and when he answers, someone with a Russian accent is on the other end. The voice on the other end invites him to a party he's having at his new place, and gives him an address. Ash doesn't say anything, so the person hangs up. Now this is exactly what the fans have been waiting for, a phone call directing them to an address to kill the Russians that reside there. Ash excitedly rushes everyone in the van saying he'll explain on the way. The fans arrive at the address and Corey insists on a stakeout. The fans find out the building houses the remnants of the Russian Mafia. Ash finally gets the door lock open and the excited fans pour in. The only one that hesitates is Mark. He has reservations about the roof, likely due to his earlier hallucination with rooster masks. Tony reassures Mark that they'll be able to escape using the roof, and Mark follows him inside. Here, each of the fans clear a floor of the Russian Mafia. When Alex and Ash get to the roof, none of the other fans are there, and they're not answering their walkie-talkies. Unknown to them, the rest of their friends have met their end at the hands of the Russian Mafia leader, who, while insanely high due to the effects of the new Russian drug, went through the building killing not only his own men, but each of the fans, whom he saw as monstrous representatives of the masks they wear. Mark was a large bear that he beat to death at the club. Corey was a zebra that was ironically shot. Tony was a massive tiger that was shot by a shotgun, and Alex and Ash appear to him as a giant twin-headed swan. However, when he makes his appearance to Alex and Ash, he instantly shoots Ash in the head. He lets out a guttural laugh, and as Alex screams at him, he shoots her as well. Unlike their idle jacket, the fans could not defeat the Russian Mafia, and were instead killed during their one chance to attack the Russians. Well, not all of them. In the outro of the level, we see that Tony has survived the Russian leader's massacre. He's gathered the body of his friends, Mark and Corey, and waits in a room for a SWAT team to arrest him. However, instead of the SWAT team, a detective walks through the door. It's Detective Pardo, the same detective that was at Alex's house a few weeks earlier. Tony puts his hands up and immediately surrenders. However, since Tony is still wearing his mask, the detective assumes Tony wants to give up so he can still revel in the small amount of fame he's gained. The detective rejects Tony's surrender and murders him in cold blood. And so, the fans' journey to end up like their idol has been met with the ultimate failure. The one chance they had to attack the Russian Mafia ended in most of their deaths, and any fame they gained during the short time they were active was wiped away when Detective Pardo killed Tony. Instead of achieving the renown that Jack had had, they died as relative nobodies. You know, at the beginning of the video, I quoted Oscar Wilde, saying, Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, and I believe the fans are a great showcase of that. However, there's more to the quote than that. The full quote is, 
Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery that mediocrity can pay to greatness. And I believe the full quote perfectly captures the spirit of the fans. They were never good enough, and with no way to become great on their own, they took to emulating their idol, Jacket, and it eventually led to their destruction. But that concludes the fan story. If you have any questions, feel free to ask and I'll do my best to answer them. But until next time, thank you for watching and see you later. Hidden among these headlining stories was the spree of a serial killer dubbed the Miami Mutilator. Although this serial killer went mostly unnoticed by the media, they weren't invisible, as Detective Manny Pardo of the Miami Police Department was on their tail. Hawaii begins making Hawaii begins making a movie. <laughs>